The hunter stalks his prey. With a camera as his only weapon and his senses on full alert, photographer Steve McCurry travels the globe and observes life through his lens. He is in search of perfect alchemy, a fragile instant in which light and the elements coincide in the sincerity of an expression, the spontaneity of a glance. An encounter lurks around any corner, one that will perhaps give birth to a unique image, a portrait of the human condition. The Merengarth Fortress. From its rocky base, this 15th century fortress towers above the horizon in the northern region of Rajasthan in India. From the walls surrounding the city, one can glimpse a mirage, a sea of calm amidst the far desert, the blue city of Yodpur. Another day in Yodpur's old town, teeming with life. This bustling area of the city, whose current population is around half a million, owes its sky-blue color to an ancient custom of adding copper sulfate to white paint. This tradition is thought to have come from fending off termites. The Clark Gate Bazaar. The heart of the city is full of life. The constant rocking of the tuk-tuks, the local taxis, mixes with the unusually heavy traffic, and men visit the barber shops elbow to elbow with all sorts of vendors. For Steve McCurry, this shower of sensations is the best way to start the day. I, I mean, this place is really amazing. I mean, there's so much kind of confusion and chaos. But, you know, on the other hand, it's, you have these shopkeepers working literally a foot from the... Uh, street and they're very quiet, very serene. I mean, and look at the color here. I mean, you don't see this kind of color anywhere in the world. India is a land of contrasts where pomp and poverty coexist naturally. In Yodpur, the luxurious palace of the Maharaja Gaj Singh is surrounded by the squalor of the streets. All of this makes the place an inexhaustible source of images, one of the photographer's favorites. Steve McCurry is living a love affair with the country. A story that began in 1974, when the columns of his hometown Philadelphia newspaper grew too small for his remarkable talent and hunger to explore the world. Working on a newspaper wasn't very satisfying because it became very repetitive and I ended up shooting sort of the same subjects over and over again. Um, so I decided kind of very early on in my newspaper career that I would, uh, I, want, I kind of was plotting my escape and I just, I sort of saved some money and after about two years I said, you know, I, I had done a lot of traveling before school. I had been in uh, South America and Europe and uh, Latin America and Middle East. So I thought, well, just, just for fun, let's go somewhere new to start this freelance career. So I thought, well, yeah, I've never been to India. Let's, uh, let me start in India. Here, he discovered his great passion. He had planned to stay just a couple of months during his first trip to India and then return home. Those two months stretched into six and then eight until two long years passed by. What was meant to be a parenthesis of adventure became a life devoted to travel and photojournalism. There was something about the place, the people, the smells and the sights and everything which um, kind of on the one hand is very often very maddening and very frustrating and very discouraging to be here because often things don't work and all that but on the other hand it was it was a continual source of uh, sort of fascination and um, I don't know maybe the worst thing you can say about a, a place or a person is that 
is that it, it's it's boring, you know. And I don't think that's one thing you can ever call India. There's always something uh, shocking. There's always something bizarre. There's always something uh, that, that, that is uh, something you've never seen in your life as you kind of round the next corner. Steve has been witness to human madness during armed conflicts. His work on Afghan rebels opened the doors to the Magnum Agency and to internationally known publications such as the New York Times, Paris Match, or the National Geographic magazine, the latter of which still runs his photographs. For more than 20 years, his snapshots have traveled around the globe. But McCurry's most famous image is the portrait of Sharbat Gula, a young Afghan girl he met in one of Pakistan's refugee camps in 1984. Her glance has become the symbol of the anguish Afghan people suffered after the Russian invasion. As a photographer, I'm very interested in portraiture, uh, primarily because I think in a picture, in a portrait, you can really see uh, the inner self of a person. You can see um, where that the life history of that person, their hopes and dreams, their fears, their anxieties, uh, their past. Uh, and if you have time to study a, f a face, and if you can look into the eyes, I think that will really give you a, a very keen insight into their human condition, or perhaps even into the total human condition, because I think we all share uh, these same emotions. Each photograph is the result of a chance encounter for which Steve can always rely on his best ally, time. As you kind of walk down the street, you kind of get into a kind of a, kind of a mental state where I think you really get into, you become much more sensitized to your surroundings. And, and some sort, some magically sometimes things start to happen. And then suddenly things start to disintegrate the, the, the moment, the, the, the situation, and then you have to dissipate, and then you have to move on down the street, and suddenly nothing seems to be happening, and you walk, and you walk, and you walk, and then, fortunately, things start to reemerge, and so it's all very, uh, by chance, it's all very mysterious how the, how the, the, the moments kind of reveal themselves. I think the important thing in a portrait is to recognize, to be able to see a face which really tells a story, which really um, is some kind of a story is written on that face. Uh, I think a person's life experience is often there, written, the lines and the expression, the eyes. Serenity and simplicity are two words that guide him in his determination to register the essence of the world that surrounds us. The serenity of his photographs emanates from the soft natural light of dawn or dusk, and from those shadows hidden in some alley where the sun does not harden features. Their simplicity relies on photographic compositions that heighten the warmth of the subjects, so we can direct our attention to the central element of most of his pictures, people. Often things aren't what they appear. People here often seem uh, sort of poor and uh, and, and uh, kind of living on the street. Uh, but often it's uh, these people are actually actually very happy and very content, even though it appears on the surface that they have nothing. But maybe in some ways they have everything because they they're content, they're happy with their life, they're happy with their family. Um, so it's often uh, hard to kind of know who's really has a better life uh, than or us. The railroad network in India is the most appreciated legacy of English colonial rule. With more than 100,000 kilometers of tracks, India has the largest network in Asia and one of the largest in the world. 
Although comfort has not evolved much since the 19th century, and the country still holds the record for railway accidents, nothing prevents millions of people from swarming the platforms every day. It is a means of transportation that allows them to cross the country from one extreme to the other for but a handful of rupees. For Steve McCurry, one means of transportation is as good as any other. For this restless nomad, who spends an average of ten months a year traveling and rarely stays more than a week in any given place, constant movement is a vital source of nourishment. I like to be surprised. I like to sort of be uh, horrified or delighted or shocked or, or ups you know, some I like. I like to be constantly. Uh, reminded that I'm alive and that yeah, I don't really get tired of traveling. In fact, I think I I draw a certain energy from traveling around, uh, meeting new people, seeing new things, actually going to places, uh, seeing old friends. So just the contrary from uh, kind of getting tired from traveling, I actually thrive on the excitement and the movement and the, the process of getting from one point to the next. Uh, after several years of running from routine and after recording human stories, the photographer claims his right as a world citizen. For him, the simple fact of crossing borders may help to make them disappear. Well, I think if there's one thing I've learned in traveling around the world for the past 25 years is, you know, whether you're in India or New York or Beijing or Damascus, uh, yeah, people are pretty much the same. I mean, basically motivated by the same thing. Everybody wants, you know, dignity and respect. Everybody wants the best for their family and you know, education and health care. So if there's one thing I think I've learned in this life is that we're all pretty much the same. We all may speak different languages. Maybe we have different customs, but fundamentally, we're pretty much the same. The small town of Pushkar lies on the western slope of the Aravelli Mountains, not far away from the Pakistani border. Located amidst the sand desert, Pushkar, with its blue water lake, is an oasis where peace and quiet can be enjoyed 11 months a year. Its streets flood with pilgrims from all across India the last week of November to participate in the Mela. This is a religious ceremony devoted to Brahma, the foremost god of the Indian trinity and a symbol for creativity. Holy Lake, uh, this is the world of uh, one temple Brahma and this is the Brahma place Pushkar. Mm -hmm. and the Vishnu place Buddha Gaya and Shiva place Varanasi. So, before was is uh, in the first time before was no Brahma place in the old world mm -hmm. only only ocean according to legend the world was created in Pushkar when Brahma who deserved a place in paradise after having meditated for hundreds of years dropped a lotus flower from the clouds the Pushkar Lake rose from the site where the flower had fallen, and the world grew around it. Nowadays, this sacred lake is surrounded by 500 temples devoted to the God of creation. After a purifying bath, pilgrims may reach Shanti, peace of the heart.
The Unt Mela, celebrated at the same time as the Mela, takes place in the dunes surrounding the holy city and consists of a livestock fair that attracts more than 200,000 sellers and buyers of camels. The day's business comes to an end when the merchants argue about the last sales. Steve McCurry takes advantage of this brief instant when the light waxes before it grows into shadows to go out in search of a look that may have something to tell. Ruga comes from the Nagura Valley, about a 20-day ride from Puskar. He explains how the trip could be made in 14 days, but he refuses to drive his camels to exhaustion. He wants them strong and impeccable to lure the best buyers. It has been a good year for Ruga. He hasn't had time to wash in the purifying waters of the lake a kilometer away, but he is already at peace. This year Ganesha, the god of prosperity, has been good to me. He's given me good camels and sent good buyers. I just got here two days ago and I've sold the seven camels I raised during the year. With the revenue of the sales, Ruga will buy a couple of females to renew his herd and have enough to cover his wife and five children's needs during the next 12 months. Today's a happy day for me. I'm at peace and have invited all the camel herdsmen who camp around to celebrate it with me. Fellow guests, prepare a spicy sauce made of green tomatoes and spices to go with traditional Indian bread, chapati. <laughs> Meanwhile, those who will sleep outside to guard their camels gather firewood to help withstand the low nighttime temperatures of the desert. Light is waning, and once again, Steve confronts an everyday frustration. There is not enough light to shoot his camera without a flash, an unnatural accessory that he refuses to use. He will have to wait until this new wave of darkness passes, until the next dawn, to keep feeding his films with new experiences. From the top of the Bodhnath Stupa in Nepal, the eyes of the Buddha contemplate the Kathmandu Valley. Almost every aspect of life in Nepal is related to these religious monuments. They are sites devoted to prayer and spiritual introspection, an important Buddhist community set between India and the high summits of the Himalayas. With its wide squares, where sculpted dragons and lions seem to stare at the few passers-by, Kathmandu is one of those magic places where time seems to have stood still centuries ago. I first came to the Kathmandu Valley about 20 years ago. And the thing which uh, I was so struck about this particular part of the world was the incredible architecture. You really feel like you've stepped back into some medieval village. Um, 
and it, it, there's a few more tourists here, but it still has that really amazing charm, and it really, it's just one of the most fascinating places I think I've ever been. Nepal is a small enclave of some 17 million people with more than 30 different ethnic groups. A diversity that is also seen in religion, since Hinduism, dominant in the country, coexists with Buddhism and Islam in astonishing harmony. After many decades x-raying the world for the most prestigious publications, and after countless prizes, Steve McCurry has earned the title of Free Electron in Photojournalism. Nowadays, he covers only the subjects that he feels passion for, like the ravages of conflict in civilian communities. But he also devotes much film to his other passion, exploring a subject in depth in order to have a monograph published later on and that serves as a reference point for professionals and admirers alike. For his next long-term project, a book on the influence of Buddhism in the world, Steve plunges into the daily life of the Kathmandu temples and gets in touch with spiritual guides. magazine photography and uh, I my work uh, in the last 10 years of, has taken me to places like uh, Burma and Cambodia and Thailand and Sri Lanka and uh, and then I suddenly uh, thought I've been to so many of these countries which uh, are Buddhist that uh, maybe it'd be a good idea to make a compilation of all these pictures and to uh, do a book on that kind of gives a sense of the of the Buddhist world. The Rinpoche Lama is a Tibetan monk who was barely a child when more than 50 years ago the Chinese invaded Tibet. He had to abandon his hometown of Lhasa to seek refuge in the neighboring country. Every afternoon, Nima Rinpoche greets Western travelers of different professions and aspiring Buddhists who seek answers in Siddhartha's doctrine. In a relaxed and informal manner, they take their time together to exchange notions about life and about a world in which globalization frequently rhymes with contradiction. You could study a little bit and shut up, Hija. One hand world is becoming better than you can serve better, better because modern world, more easy. People can travel in easy and and uh, many good, there's many good things also appe appearing, appearing, like say the skill of doctors, operation, laser operation, or, you know, different type of medicine. Many things are very, very good. We have many good, uh, good, good things. <coughs> and other hands, so we have uh, now we are sort of very worried, scared time. There are so many bombs, mm -hmm. atom bomb, neutral bomb, bug, bug, bug bomb, <laughs> disease bomb. Yeah. So now people worry even to open later. According to Buddhist thought, peace comes from knowledge and acceptance of others. And Rinpoche Lama organizes these gatherings with the will to open a dialogue between people of different cultures and beliefs. 
a humanist initiative to which Steve contributes with a global vision and a simple camera, giving its most humane face to a colorful world. But still, I think the, the people here are pretty much the same as maybe people anywhere. I mean, they laugh, they cry, they want respect, they um, laugh. I mean, you know, the sense of humor, I think, whether you speak the language or not, you can get that across. So to me, I, I've always uh, tried to show the, the link between different peoples and to show that kind of fundamentally we're all the same.